Right, good Shabbos, everyone. Good to see you guys at Shul, Baruch Hashem. All right, let me ask you guys a question and feel free to give me your answer. What do you guys consider the best children's story in the Bible? What do you guys think is the best children's story in the Bible? David and Goliath. Which one? David and Goliath. David and Goliath. Wonderful, right? Teach our kids about murdering people that are bigger than them by throwing them with stones. Fantastic children's story, right? What else? What other stories do you consider good children's Bible stories? Noah's Ark, fantastic. God wipes out most of humanity by drowning them and having their corpses float on the water. Lovely story, right? Daniel in the lion's den where Daniel pulls the teeth. Fantastic, beautiful story, right? So we've got a bunch of opinions about what makes a good children's story, right? And we've got books upon books of kids' books that tell us these stories in a very lighthearted and lovely way. Today, we are studying a new book in the Torah. We are starting the book of Leviticus, the book of Vayikra, also known as the book of priests. And what does it start off with? Blood and offering sacrifices on the altar. And lo and behold, when this question was asked to our sages, what do you think is a good children's story? They decided in the Perkei vote, at age five, our children begin the study of Torah. And what do they start with? Talmud tells us the book of Leviticus, Vayikra. This is a wonderful children's story. Learn about offering, sacrificing animals and pouring the blood out on the altar. The explanation that's given by the Talmud is that children are pure. So let the pure occupy themselves with things of purity, which is the book of Leviticus, right? We're learning all about the Levitical laws of ritual purity. So this week in, uh, in Jewish homes all around the world, Five-year-olds are starting their study of Torah for the very first time, learning how to say, and they're learning about the Torah for the first time in depth, even though they start learning about the parashahs and the kids' stories, you know, these wonderful stories we just mentioned. They already know those by this stage. Now, let's be honest, this is a weird place to start teaching your child about the Torah and Hashem in the book of Leviticus. Even this explanation that the pure keep themselves busy with things that are pure, it doesn't seem, you know, What's the word? Like the type of thing that would really suit our children, right? We, hey, fitting. It's a bit heavy for the kids. Yeah, exactly. Right. When last you take your kid to the back of the butchery to show them how their horses get on their plates and how their chicken nuggets make it into their stomachs. Do that, the kid will never again eat, right? You think this isn't a place that would suit children, but our sages in their infinite wisdom are teaching us a lesson in how to pass on the Torah and its values to the next generation. And I'm gonna explain this with a long explanation and we'll get to this at the end, right? And I think this parasha, parashat Vayikra in and of itself, teaches us the same lesson. How to preserve our holy scriptures and our traditions so that we can pass it on to the next generation. Because what we learn about in the parasha, other than all the meat offerings and the grain offerings, there's something that gets added to every single one of those offerings, and that is salt. Right, Wednesday night is Purim. You're gonna, with your salt, you're gonna have tequila and limes. You know the whole thing with Purim. But this week, I want to speak about salt and how we understand salt, because salt is meant to be what a preservative, right? Salt is one of the common denominators that we find throughout all of the offerings in this week's parasha, right? So with all the meat offerings, you have to add salt. Even with the mincha, the grain offering you have to have salt as well. And that's why we have the tradition in Judaism that whenever we eat challah, we're supposed to dip it in salt to remind you of the sacrifices and the offerings and the everlasting covenant Hashem made with us. Some people actually have a tradition to dip the challah specifically three times in the salt because in the verse where it talks about the mincha offering, uh, it tells us three times it uses the word salt. I can see on Zoom, there's the challah that's supposed to come here. It's pure mchala, full of colors and little chocolate balls and stuff like that. So we'll get that before, God willing, before the service ends. Unless my mom finishes the Okay, so salt is important in the week's parasha. What is the purpose of salt? Why do we need to add salt? What does salt do? Salt, of course, is basically the world's oldest preservative. Back then, they didn't have fridges and they didn't have freezers like we have today. Even though, with that said, we've got load shedding three times a day. So our fridges and our freezers anyway are working. So you guys might want to go back and start using salt again, right? And uh, they used to use salt, specifically a certain size of salt. If the salt is too small, it gets dissolved away into the meat. If the salt is too big, it'll just fall off the meat. So it needs to be a certain flat size, a flaky salt, which is called today kosher salt. 
or apropos. It's called kosher salt today. And this is how you would preserve your meat. And if you were to salt your meat uh, properly, it could stand hanging in your garage for decades. If you use enough salt, of course. I wouldn't suggest you do that because then obviously, what does it taste like? You can't eat anymore, right? Uh, so yeah, okay. So they use salt to preserve the meats, right? Um, and uh, what did we do then, of course, the salt itself, would, uh, it would drag out some of the waters and the juices from inside the meat and dry up the meat. What is this process called? Osmosis. <laughs> <Bultong. laughs> it's called osmosis. And I have a sneaky suspicion this is why Moses told us to have salt with every offering, because it's got his name in it, osmosis. Anyway, <laughs> he's cheeky, wasn't he? So the reason why we have salt is because it preserves the meat. And Hashem told us to do this, not just for practical purposes, but also symbolic purposes. I mean, to teach us a lesson, because when Hashem talks about his covenant, he refers to it as covenants of soul. Because the covenants are eternal. It's supposed to be preserved by us from generation to generation, not thrown away, never to be canceled. The covenants need to last forever. Okay, It preserves it. Now, salt, with the, if you taste salt, just as it is, salt tastes horrible, right? How many of you have ever eaten spoons of salt like this? Stephen has, okay? So we must yeah. pray for Stephen. <laughs> more, more specifically, we must pray for Preeti, right? Wait until he gets the sugar, eh? So salt, you're not supposed to eat it just like that, right? Salt's flavor, salt itself actually tastes horrible. But we add salt to food, why? Because the salt brings out the flavoring within the food itself. That's why we add salt, of course, right? And this in itself is also symbolic for us when it comes to reading and learning about bringing our offerings and our sacrifices unto Hashem. Because yes, we take this little lamb or we take this goat or we take this cow or this chicken or whatever, this uh, turtle dove is what the Torah talks about. And we lean on it, we do the whole shmicha process as if it's us that's supposed to be going to the altar instead of the animal. And that's what Hashem wants. That's why we add salt because we're not allowed to add any other flavoring agents to our offerings. The parasha tells us you're forbidden to have honey on the altar. Like specifically fruit honey, that uh, fructose and sucrose, that kind of thing. You're not allowed to have this on the altar. Why? Because it adulters what the flavor of the meat was supposed to be in the first place. That's why we have salt. So to our offerings, when we bring our offerings unto our shin, it needs to be us, a pure and holy offering representing us. That is something we should go check. So that's why we add salt to bring out that original thing, right? Even the animals themselves, they are not meant to be food for God, right? Of course, God would like a bride, right? I don't blame him, right? But it's burnt meat most of the time. He, do, he's not, he doesn't want the meat for the flavor. He wants it to be us offering up basically our souls unto Hashem. That's why even when the temple is gone, what do we do instead of animal offerings? We no longer offer bulls and goats, but the offering of our lips. Because what uh, our heart overflows comes out of the mouth, right? The offering of our lips is the deepest, most core part of us. And we're offering this up to Hashem. So this is what Hashem wants from us. And Paul even in, uh, instructs us that when we have conversations with each other, we should season our conversations with salt. We must say things that preserve, things that last forever. And specifically, always add words of Torah to our conversations. Now, today I want to talk about the way that Yeshua uses salt, or more specifically, how he uses a metaphor of salt in the gospel. Because Yeshua gives us a really weird analogy in the gospels. It's in all the gospels. Uh, in Matthew's gospel, it's in the Sermon on the Mount, where Yeshua says to his disciples, what if salt loses its saltiness or salinity? I'm going to use saltiness today because it sounds cool. He says, then it is useless and it is to be thrown out and trampled on by the sons of men. What is Yeshua saying when he asks, what if salt loses its saltiness? Can salt lose its saltiness? No, it can't. So what's going on here? And the saying of Yeshua has confused Christian commentators for decades, so much so that they end up bending the, the physics of nature to try and explain. It. They would say, oh, no, what Jesus actually was saying was if you take some salt and you put it in this massive bucket of water, then it's diluted. Then it loses its saltiness. And they come up with all these explanations to try and explain what Yeshua was trying to say and how it's physically possible for salt to lose its saltiness. But the answer is it's wrong. And that's not what Yeshua was trying to say. They're missing the entire point of what Yeshua was trying to teach them. So today I want to look at this by looking at an example that luckily, God will, God will, God will, grace of Hashem, we find an example of this exact same phrase that Yeshua used 
We find it used by one of our rabbis in the Talmud. It can shed some light on how we are supposed to understand it. But before we go to the Talmud, I'll give you that quote. I first want to take you to Athens, following Paul on his journey. So you remember when Paul finds himself in Athens, it's in Acts chapter 17. He has to wait there for old Silas and old Timothy, with us today, and Timothy to come and join him uh, down in Athens. And while Paul is there, he's got to keep himself busy. He's got to make some money. So what does Paul do by profession? He's a tent builder, right? So he sets up his little shop in the market and he starts selling people. He's selling tents. He can repair tents. He can do this, etc., etc. He can put up your tent for your fire, fire conference this weekend, etc., etc. And while he's seeing people and doing business, you obviously know what is Paul doing. He is sharing the gospel with the people that come into this market. He was the apostle unto the Gentiles. So all these pagans that are working through, walking through these, uh, these markets and every corner there's a different idol for them to bow down or to touch or to worship. He's trying to teach them about Hashem, the one true God. And while Paul is there in Athens, of course, and teaching people and sharing with them about the one true God, where does he get his kosher meat from? The Jewish community in Athens. We know that there was a Jewish synagogue there in Athens. The Gospels tell us, history tells us, tells us there was a synagogue where both Jews and God-fearers went. So if Paul packed up his, uh, his little shop every week just before Friday, that Shabbos he would go to the local shul, the local synagogue, and he'd pray there along the other Jews. And while he was there, what do you think he did? He shared with them a little bit about Yeshua, the Messiah. And he shared the gospel in that synagogue as well. Okay, so while Paul was doing this and sharing with every single person that he walks across, very much like my dad, everyone he meets has to hear a story, right? Paul is sharing with people the gospel everywhere he goes. And eventually the word gets out. There's this Jewish fellow in the market down there by the tent master who is telling us about a different God. And word eventually makes its way up to the Greek philosophers, the council of philosophers there in Athens. You'll remember that Athens was a seat of philosophy at that stage, right? We had this council of philosophers. We had word, eh? Uh, they called themselves the Areopagus. They stood on this uh, rock on the mountain Mars Mountain, I think it was. And this was where the center of philosophy was in that day. And anyone had anything new to come and share philosophically, any new discoveries, any new thoughts, any new gods, etc., like that, they would come there before this council of philosophers and they would share their case. The Book of Acts tells us people would come there to find out what's new in the world of philosophy. But it was also very dangerous because there were certain guidelines you had to follow. And if you did something wrong, they could put you to death. For example, it is this very group of philosophers that sentenced Socrates, the famous Socrates, to death as well. They gave him two counts for death. One of them was that he introduced a foreign god. So what happened was, at that stage, they had this menu, where you, multiple choice menu, where you could choose which god you want to base your philosophy on. But you couldn't introduce a new god. But this is what we were set with. You had to choose either chicken or fish, and you couldn't have any more options. You had to choose one of these gods. Socrates came and they accused him of introducing a new God and had him put to death. Okay, now Paul, when he was summoned, he was very clever about this. Paul noticed as he, was, as he was looking at all the idols, all the statues that they made to each one of these gods, that there was a statue towards a God whose name was unknown. At the bottom, if you lifted it up, it said, become bait, squad shopper, because it was no name brand. It was a no name brand God that they said, just in case they missed one. So Paul used this to his advantage when he went to have this debate in front of these philosophers. And he said, you guys worship a God you don't even know. You don't even know his name. Let me tell you about this God. So if you don't put him to death, it's not anybody. Right? Very clever. Paul was very clever when he did this. And he had this whole argument with them. And he actually did pretty well, even though some of them had an issue with him. Um, maybe he used, you guys are familiar with that story of um, Abraham and the idol shop. Right? That, uh, that midrash about Abraham who was Father Terach left him in charge of the idol shop. And when he came back, all the idols were broken. Abraham, Abraham said to his father, it wasn't me. It was that one idol that destroyed all the other idols. Right? And his dad said, it's an idol. It can't do that. The famous Midrash. Maybe Paul shared this Midrash with him. I would like to think that Paul shared that story with these philosophers when he was talking about the no-name God and all the other gods that they were worshiping there at the same time. But Paul went up and he spoke about this. And of course, it was very dangerous because they could have sentenced him to death as well. But Paul does very well because at the end of this debate, even though some of the people were saying Paul is a seed picker, because Paul would pick up a little 
story from this philosophy and a story from that philosophy. Paul would quote a saying from that poem written by, uh, what was that poet's name? I don't remember his name. Anyway, one of their philosophy uh, poems, he would take a little saying out of there to try and convince them about the one true God, right? Paul tells us that he becomes all men to every, uh, all things to every kind of man, right? To the Jews is a Jew, amongst the Greeks is a Greek, etc. He's trying to teach them about the one true God through using what they already know, what they are used to. Their types of sayings, as if I was to come here and say, hey, Hashem is lacquer. Then you South Africans will start following Hashem, something like that, right? Paul was doing that same thing. And eventually, even though many of them didn't like what Paul was saying, it does tell us in the book of uh, Acts that he actually converted one or two people. A guy by the name of Dionysus, one of the guys that was on the council, became a believer, and another lady as well. Amazing story, what Paul was doing there. Now, that is the background for the Talmudic story I want to share with you guys today. The Talmudic story comes from track like Bechoros AP, uh, and it's about a famous rabbi, one of the most well-known rabbis in the Talmud, Rabbi Yehoshua, when he found himself in Athens. So he came to Athens, and the reason why he came to Athens was because um, the Caesar at that time, this is how the story goes, uh, the Caesar at that time summoned the Jews to send one of their leaders, take me to your leader, right? One of their leaders to come and debate the philosophers in Athens to once and for all decide whose God is real or if your God, the Jewish God, falls into this menu of gods that are allowed. So the Jews had to come together and decide which rabbi we're going to send, and we sent Rabbi Yehoshua. Rabbi Yehoshua was genius. Okay? He was a halachic genius. He knew how to argue like crazy. So we sent him because he was pretty much our best lawyer. This is where the Jewish lawyer started, right? And he came up there to Athens, and where would he have stayed? He would probably have lodged with the Jewish community and went to that synagogue on Sabbath and prayed with them and ate and eaten his kosher food there while he was waiting for this debate. And while he was there in that synagogue, he definitely would have heard about this other Jewish Christian believer by the name of Paul, who already had done this before, who had went to this council in Athens and had the debate with them and even got one of the people on the council to become a believer. So he must have been, you know, uh, buoyed by this idea that it's happened before and he is now going to go debate with these guys. So the Talmud tells us the debate, and it's a very long section of all the different um, parables that, the, uh, that these uh, philosophers throw towards uh, Rabbi Yahushua. And each one of the questions that they ask him is loaded with theological impetus behind it. They ask a simple question, but they're, they've got, you know, like a sneaky reason behind each one of the questions. So I want to just share with you one or two of them before we get to the salt. They start off by asking him the question, Rabbi Yoshua, you tell us. Oh, and by the way, I'm going to add this. This is a funny story if you guys ever read it in the Talmud. Um, Rabbi Yoshua expected that they don't want to debate in the first place. He thought that as soon as he gets there, they're going to try and kill him anyway because they hated the Jews. So he was very clever. He was sneaky. He noticed that they've got these sentries, these guards that walk in shifts around this mountain to make sure that no one can see him. And what they do is they look for footprints in the sand. And if they see a footprint that isn't theirs, well, they probably walk on each other's footprints the way the whole time. If they see a foreign footprint, they immediately chase that foot footprint and kill the person they can find. So what does Rabbi Yoshua do? He takes his sandals, puts them on backwards, and he walks in. So that eventually, by the time he's inside, they're following his footsteps and they're killing each other, these sentries, while they're trying to catch him. And he makes his way in front of the council. Now ask him a first question. They say, if a baby chick, baby chicken in its egg, dies before the egg hatches, how does the soul escape from that egg? Why do they ask a question like this? They didn't think about the chicken or the egg one. Remember that one? Okay, mm -hmm. first. Why did I ask this? Remember, each of these questions are loaded with theological significance. Maybe it was because they were questioning the Jewish belief of the divine soul. Maybe they were questioning the Catholic belief of baby baptism. No, it doesn't it didn't exist yet. But anyway, it's very interesting. Maybe they were trying to argue about abortion, which was something they had no issue with. They were asking in this question to try and call him. But Rabbi Yehoshua was a no-nonsense rabbi. So what did he do? He threw out the premise of the question in the first place. He said, here's my answer. The soul escapes to the exact same place that it entered. Can you tell me where the soul entered? Okay, good. Next question. <laughs> so they thought of another question. And they said to him, ah, here we have a question for you. You are sure to fail this time. How does one harvest a field full of knives or sickles? Since we're going communist nowadays. How does one harvest a field full of sickles? Because what do you need to harvest? You need a sickle. You need a knife. 
So this one was also loaded with theology, right? This is the famous old question. How do we have a creation without a creator? But how can a creator create tools without tools? Right, you guys will, will maybe remember that Kirke vote where it talks about the things that we created before sunset on the first Sabbath. It says one of the things that we created were the first tongs that we used to make more tongs. Like you can't make a tool without having tools in the first place. So they're asking him this very question. And he decides to indulge him a little bit there. He gives them an answer this time. He says, you harvest knives and sickles from the field with a donkey's horn. And they said, uh, there's a bit of a problem there. Donkeys don't have horns. There's no such thing. And Rabbi Yoshi replied, a field full of knives? There is no such thing. <laughs> they don't grow out of the ground. All right. Then they, they came with this one that I want to share with you today. They asked him this question that Yeshua says in the Gospels. When salt loses its saltiness, they asked, what can you use to preserve the salt? These guys were the world's first salties. Mm -hmm. What can you use to preserve the salt that has lost its saltiness? So once again, he indulges them and he gives them an answer. He says, you can use the afterbirth of a mule. Problem with that? Mules don't give birth. They can't give birth. He says you must use the afterbirth of a mule. So once again, they say to him, there is no such thing as the afterbirth of a mule. And he said, there is no such thing as salt that loses its saltiness. You ask a stupid question, you get a stupid answer. That's what's going on here. All right, so it goes on the, the, the story in the Talmud, very interesting. It says eventually he decided to prove it to them through miracles and he floated in the air between the heavens and the earth to show them. Uh, it's one of the stuff he did. Another question they asked him is, where is the middle of the earth? Because they wanted to know about hell. Because Jews believe in heaven and hell. So he said, I'll point to it. And he pointed with his finger and his finger grew all the way to the point of middle earth. And he touched middle earth. And he said, there, found it. Mic drop. And there was nothing that they could do. Anyway, so there's a lot of fanciful stories that make things sound like some... Marvel character or something, some superhero. But why did they ask him about the salt? Let's break the salt question down. Because once again, all of these things that they're asking him, and the reason why they're having this debate with him in the first place is because they want to turn against his Jewish beliefs and his Jewish traditions. They want to do away with that and say, what they've got, that's something new that they're preaching, that is uh, the new thing, right? Out of the old and in with the new. So when they were saying to him, salt loses its saltiness, they were referring to the Torah because the Torah is the thing that preserves the Jewish people, that preserves our covenants and our traditions. They were saying to Rabbi Yahushua, the Torah is old, it's outdated. It has become rancid. It needs a few updates, 2.0, right? Maybe they said, let's call it the Old Testament from now on, something like that. Who knows? <laughs> so it's a similar conversation as what we're having today with the same, right? They were saying, take on what is new, this new philosophy that we are preaching here. But Rabbi Yahushua countered them with just as cryptic an answer when he said, with the afterbirth of a mule. Because what do, you know, what do we know about a mule? A mule, it looks like a pretty good thing to have, good animal to have. It's the descendant of a, an offspring of a female horse and a male donkey, right? Which means that it is very strong. It is very sure-footed. It's clever. It's healthier than a donkey. It's not so susceptible to the different diseases that donkeys get. It literally looks like the next best thing that you can cook up in a lab for an animal, right? Symbolically speaking, this was a person who now left their Judaism and started adding some of these new philosophies. How would this look? This is the new improved Hellenized Jew, the Greek Jew, super Jew, it's called him super Jew, it was made in a lab. He no longer looks like the old traditional Jew. He's cut off his tzitzits. He's no longer wearing a kippah anymore. That's not what he wears for his outfit because there's so little clothes people wear in those days, remember? He's no longer wearing tzitzits. He's no longer being circumcised. He now has a six pack because he doesn't eat his challah on Shabbos. He doesn't keep Shabbos, so he doesn't get fat like the rest of us. This is the new improved looking Jew that they were offering to him. So Rabbi Yahushua said, sure, a mule looks good. It looks like it's promising all the things you need, but there is one problem with this. You can't just take a piece of this animal, a piece of that animal, and put it together. Just like you can't take our religion, Judaism, and then take a piece of Judaism, but mix it with a piece of something else and something else and something else. That's a problem. That's why he says, not just a mule, but the afterbirth of a mule. Because a mule cannot reproduce. 
a mule cannot make another generation. Meaning that this new salt that they were uh, trying to ascribe to Rabbi Yoshua, you should, you know, Rabbi Yoshua was saying, this religion that you are trying to convince me of will not endure. It will not perpetuate through your children. It will one day disappear. Was he right? He was right. History has proven this fact. Reminds me of that story we always tell when we talk about the Sabbath and how we change our Sabbath traditions about the dad who has a very important meeting tomorrow. So he goes and buys himself a brand new suit and he goes home to quickly drop off the suit and he asks his wife, honey, can you please just uh, help me with the suit? It's a bit long. And he cut the legs a bit shorter and the arms a bit shorter. And then tomorrow at my meeting, I will be fenced. And she says, I don't know, you know, I've got this uh, breakfast with my friends. I'll see if I find time. Just leave it on the counter. So he goes to his daughter and he says to her, honey, will you please help me out and just cut off a little piece of my pants and my, and my jacket and my shirt? And she says, I don't know, dad, I'm not busy with this guy calling or and she's too busy. And so he says, okay, fine, I'll leave it on the counter. And he goes to his son and says, oh, son, will you help me out? And he shouts at his dad, dad, I can't pause the game. I'm online. Et cetera, et cetera. So eventually he goes to work and he leaves his suit there at home. And eventually his wife remembers what the husband asked. So she goes and takes the pants and she takes the suit and she cuts off a little bit to what his length would be. And she puts it back on the counter. And then comes the daughter. And she decides, ah, oh, I'm going to help my dad out. He did off the wall by with his phone. And she cuts off a little bit of the pants and the jacket. And then comes the son because it was load shedding, so he couldn't play online anymore. And he comes and he cuts off another piece. Eventually, what's left? Nothing short of a bikini for the father to wear to his important meeting tomorrow morning. You see, if we keep cutting away from the Torah, if we keep cutting away from our traditions, the religion that we pass on to our children will be unrecognizable in one simple generation. Unrecognizable to what it was before. So the Torah is like salt. The Torah is compared to salt because it preserves the Jewish people, it preserves our covenant. It endures forever and it preserves us. We're not allowed to add or to subtract to the Torah. It's a commandment. And history has proved this like I said. What has happened to Greek philosophies? How many people go to the church of Greek philosophy today? Zero. What about Romans and their philosophies and beliefs and their gods? Zero. What about the Persians, the great empire of the Persians? Anyone practicing Persianism nowadays? No, we just buy their carpets. That's what we do nowadays. Everything else is gone. But the people of Israel and Israel Chai, we still practice the exact same Torah, the exact same faith, the exact same belief that we've had since it was given to Moses. You guys just lifted your pinky and you said, this is the Torah that was given to Moses. No additions, no subtractions, no updates. The exact same thing that Hashem gave to Moshe on Mount Sinai. And that is what this special Sabbath also communicates, because today is a special Sabbath called Shabbos Zachor, which means, Zachor, remember, Sabbath of remembrance. We have to remember what Amalek did when he attacked at the back. He attacked who? He attacked the weak and the defenseless, those who couldn't think for themselves, those who needed to be taught by us how the Torah works and what is important to learn. He attacked them. And today, even though we don't have Amalek today, we don't have the temple, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, the spirit of Amalek is still alive and it attacks our children. Trying to do what? Trying to stop the perpetuation of the Torah in our lives. We have the same threat today. Wednesday, we, Wednesday night, we celebrate Purim. We remember what happened to another Amalekite by the name of Haman. Haman tried to do the same thing. He said to the king, There's a people in your kingdom who do not follow your laws, they follow some other laws. We need to update those laws to our laws. And then we follow this updated laws. It's the exact same thing that Amalek is trying to do. And this is why we start our children with a Torah study on Parashat Vayikra, this parasha, because we need to preserve their purity with salt. Not assault. You're assaulting your kids. I need to speak with you. But we need to preserve their purity with salt, with the Torah. So back to Yeshua saying, do you think Yeshua didn't understand that salt can't lose its saltiness? Of course, he understood this. It was a basic understanding of nature. Yeshua was making a point to his disciples. He said to the disciples, you are the salt of the earth. So if you lose your saltiness, what does that mean? It means if you forget the Torah, if you forget doing the good deeds that our tradition teaches, if you forget the teachings that I, your master, have taught you, then you are as worthless as salt that can't be salty. Your very purpose 
you have failed at. And then the nations will trample you underfoot. And he follows this up with another analogy. Right after the soul he gives them the analogy of the light of the world. He says to them, you are the light of the world. A city that sits on the mountain will not be hidden. Everyone can see it. The whole point is for it to be seen, right? Nor do people kindle a lamp just to put it under a bushel me measure, under a cup to hide the light. No, he says, they put it on the menorah to illuminate all who are in the house. So also shine your light before all men so that they may see your good deeds and glorify who? Glorify you. Glorify your father in heaven. So he was telling his disciples that they need to live Torah observant, Torah obedient lives. They need to preserve the Torah and the teachings that he gave to his disciples. And they need to show it. They need to shine to all those around them and teach them the same thing today. Like Paul, even in the marketplace, was preaching about the one true God. Even went up before that scary council that could have put him to death. And he still testified to them about the one true God and his son Yeshua, whom he had sent. So that is a lesson for us today. 2,000 years later, Yeshua is telling us the same thing. We also have to be the salt of the earth. We too have to shine our light before all men so that they can see us and see our good deeds so that it may glorify our Father in heaven. I can't imagine personally going up to this council and standing there and saying, hey, I'm here to represent my belief. I'm going to defend us or else I'll die. That scares me. Someone asked me this week, tomorrow I've got a phone call with someone at, what's this big church? The big Afrikaans church? They want to hold the Pesach Seder. They want me to come lead it for like over 100 people or something. We'll see. I'll chat with them tomorrow about that. It scares me, but here's the thing. We are called to do that. This is what Yeshua says, us as disciples, we have to do. Right? We have to go and debate. We have to go and teach. We have to shine our light before all men. But we all do that differently, right? Not all of us are skilled orators like Paul who speak for hours on end. And only one guy falls asleep and falls out the window. Not all of us are like Rabbi Yahushua, this halachic genius who could debate these guys and beat them at their own game. But that's okay. Because our lifestyle sometimes speaks louder than words. And we need to salt our lifestyle with the words and the teachings of the Torah and of our Messiah. We have to preserve it by living lives of holiness. This is your purpose-driven life. Remember when they forced us into that book? This is your purpose-driven life. The Torah and its teachings. Messiah's teachings. If you don't, then you are as useless as salt. It isn't salt. It makes sense. If you're not living a life of holiness, then why are you a holy creation in the first place? You are missing your entire purpose. You're wasting air, basically. So along with all the other five-year-olds in the Jewish world across the globe this week, let's enter the book of Leviticus. Let's study the book of Leviticus like children, like the purity of children. And let's teach our own children the same thing. Let's salt them with the words of Hashem so that we can preserve the Torah for the next generation and the next generation and the next generation. It will endure forever. As Paul tells us in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, he says, Offer yourselves as a sacrifice living and holy unto God, because this is the logical temple worship for you. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. With a pinch of salt.